I see that. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, September 20th, 2020. Uh, welcome. I'm your host, Matt Dillon. He joined this, me this week. We have a very special guest, Dr. Hector Garcia, who's the author of groundbreaking books, Alpha God, The Psychology of Religious Violence and Oppression, and Sex, Power, and Partisanship, How Evolutionary Science Makes Sense of Our Political Divide. How are you, Hector? Welcome. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Of course. I got a couple of announcements to get out of the way really quickly, and then we'll, uh, we'll chat a little bit. But what this means is that while normally we prioritize theist calls, and we will do that as well, because we have a psychologist here, if there are people with psych-specific questions about the nature of belief, the psychology belief, the impacts of various things, some um, maybe wild hypothesis that you've been wanting to do to run by an actual expert, today would be your day to call. Uh, for those of you who are watching us live on YouTube at this very moment, uh, if you look directly up above the chat, there's a little donate link. We stopped using Super Chats because as a nonprofit organization, we can use that donate link and every penny that you donate goes directly to the ACA. It doesn't, you know, Google and YouTube don't collect $200 as we pass go or anything. It all goes to us, helps us keep producing the show. And uh, while we're still making renovations to the building and we hope that the, you know, we hope to be back in there at some point, at some point before the world falls apart, um, we are continuing to do things remotely, and that means that you know some of the costs have actually gone up. We've made sure that uh, everybody who's involved in all the programs as a regular host or co-host, that we're getting better lighting for people and mics for people and stuff like that, so we can continue doing this. Uh, this Backstreet Boys reunion will not slow us down. I've been told that's the language that YouTube uh, will not catch on to what I'm actually talking about, but you can click that donate listen link up above. In addition, there's merchandise that you can actually uh, order from bit.ly slash AEN merch. And you can also become a member of the YouTube channel. And in addition to joining the YouTube channel there to become a member, which will make your name show up in green and you can be supported there. You can also support us at patreon.com, uh, the atheist experience there. There are two new Facebook groups that we're letting people know about. One is the, uh, atheist experience fan group. And the other one is the atheist experience private fan group. The URLs up there. And last and most definitely not least, this show doesn't exist and doesn't go out without the help of a lot of people, including people that you're not going to see, even when I say, put up the picture of the crew, because there's the awesome people who are working actively today uh, on video and audio and call screening and everything else that goes on that I may not even know about. But in addition to those people, this show and this organization exist because of the efforts of countless people over decades. While I've been hosting the show for 15 years, this is actually season 24, I think. Uh, should be down there. Yep, 24, episode 38. And so, yeah, I've. It, it's amazing how many people have been involved throughout the years with this. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to everybody involved. And on that note, I want to welcome my friend Hector here. How how are you? I know I asked you how you're doing, but give us a give us the, the real deal because a lot of people psychologically are suffering during this time because of masks and social distancing and no gatherings of, you know, over 10 people and all this stuff. Uh, you and I talked about this a little bit the other day. How are you holding up and what kind of recommendations do you have for, for people who are finding it incredibly difficult in this changing world? Oh, it's rough. I mean, bottom line is, you know, we are, we've talked about this. We're, we're social primates and, and we, we, our brains are adapted to interface with other other people and it's 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 hard so you know we have to get creative about it use social media you know um get on zoom chats i mean interact as much as you can um so how i've been dealing with it is this insufferable insufferable boredom is is uh, just by trying to get creative and i actually uh had a, a, a first show on my new youtube channel um, Dr. Hector A. Garcia, you know, trying to, trying to do something like that, but yeah, it's hard. Read, interact, exercise, try not to gain too much weight <laughs> and try not to develop a drinking problem. Yeah. You know, what can I say? I, I don't know if we put up your, your, your splash screen cause I was distracted at the moment, but I know that your, your new podcast, you were getting help from genetically modified skeptic and you want to give him a, a shout out as well. Um, and if there's, yeah. I don't know, is, is the podcast on the link for the splash that we had up? I didn't even see it. There we yeah, go. it should be. Yeah, Drew McCoy from Genetic, the Genetically Modified Skeptic. He produced it. I love Drew's show. He's a, he's probably one of the smartest young uh, free thought content creators out there. So yeah. check out his stuff too while you're at it. 
So there's all the information you can use there to find uh, more from Hector. What are you working on lately? Have you started like book number 73 or something? Uh, you know, I, I, I've been just the podcast. I'm working on book chapters, things like that. And evolutionary psych, I'm oh, kind of staving off the urge to write another book on the psychology of false belief in the, in, in the, you know, in the time of, of COVID-19 deniers and people who, you know, regard uh, Donald Trump as a, as a, as a true bona fide Christian, you know, um, there's a whole psychology about that, that I think the, the world needs to know about. So trying to not start a new book on that because I don't have the time right now, but I think I probably will end up doing a, a podcast on that topic because it's, it's huge. Well, it'll be interesting. And as a reminder, the atheist community of uh, the, the atheist experience is sponsored by the atheist community of Austin, a nonprofit Nonpartisan educational Nonpartisan. organization promoting right. positive atheism and the separation of religion and government. Uh, you can go to atheist-community.org for more information there. What do you think, Hector? You want to jump in and start talking to some people about what's going on in their lives and what they believe and why? Let's jump in. I got it. We got uh, Jonathan in the UK. Uh, you're, you've got questions about your partner, and it seems like you may, might have picked a good week to call in about it. Hi, Matt. Hi, Hi Hector. Hello. Cheers. Um, I think if I'm right, you've both got uh, Christian backgrounds, so I think that might help you uh, answer this one. I do not, but go ahead. Okay, well, well then specifically, Matt, I know from uh, listening to a few of your things in the past, you've got much more Christianity in your background than I have. Um, so I'm an atheist. Um, my wife is a Christian, and she's been through some some very difficult things of late, and is um, is worried that that or feels that God is is uh, punishing her, mm -hmm. and I want some advice on how to handle that without challenging her faith. Because I'm well, I'm happy to challenge people's faith outside of, of marriage and so on. This so you'd like to stay I'm married, not trying to change about my wife. Yeah. Uh, I understand that. And, and it, I don't think that anybody has to have any sort of Christian background to have thoughts on this. And, and I think I'm really looking forward to, to Hector's thoughts on this specifically. But it, so the questions that I would ask, you know, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I think God is punishing me and this is why things are going wrong in my life. My I don't know how to address that without challenging what their beliefs are. You You are challenging a belief. You don't necessarily have to challenge every aspect of that belief. You can say, well, if God is punishing you, I mean, have you been, you know, I'm faithful to this God of you sincerely reached out to find out what's going on. If you ask God and maybe you're not getting an answer, but if you're doing everything that you can to try to be right with God and God is still punishing you or, or you think God is still punishing you, maybe it's possible that you're wrong. And that really what's happening here is that God isn't punishing you, but you are the type of person who is looking at this and thinking that's the case. And you need to, I, I really can't go beyond that uh, other than saying, how do you tell the difference between I think God is punishing me and God is actually punishing me? But I, I don't know how to ask that without really challenging somebody's faith. Yeah, it, it's hard. My, you know, the, the only thing I, I would like to say about this is that when you're going through problems and, and you project those problems onto, onto God, it's just, it's almost like you're, you're removing your own agency from solving these problems. And then it becomes kind of like a negativity bias, like any bad thing that happens, you think, oh, I'm being punished, I'm being punished. And it just kind of compounds because that's what you're focusing on. It just seems like like a really negative spiral. So um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm more curious about the reasons behind why you wouldn't challenge her belief on on this topic besides you know wanting to stay married as matt <laughs> mentioned I, it, yeah so so that, that that's a it's a fair question um i i see it as sort of part of the um part of the deal and so on on there that um uh i'm i'm, I'm not trying to to challenge who she is and um uh but i but i accept that this is this makes it kind of difficult to uh to challenge a particular aspect of her religion um and uh hopefully 
good times will come and and things will get into context. But um, uh, I was I was wondering if there was if there was anything specific about um, why why people believe within Christianity that they're being punished. Ah, you could. Yeah, and, and there's lots. There's there's some stuff that which I'm sure Hector can address from a psychological standpoint, and also from a biblical standpoint. You kind of you kind of handcuffed me a little bit by asking me how do you deal with this without challenging somebody's faith because it, it is a functional part of their faith. I mean, there's lots of questions I'd love to hear the answer to from your wife, which is why does she think God's punishing her, and 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 is God punishing you as well, or is she is God punishing her? because she's married to you, because you're essentially a non-believer apostate. Um, I grew up in a family where if something was going wrong, it's because your walk with God wasn't good enough. You, you had done something wrong and you were deserving. God was basically putting hardships and trials and tribulations in your path to try to get you on the right path. This is a fundamental idea within Christianity that we are fallen and broken. We can never live up to what God expects. And God is going to put trials in our path in order to help us find our way back to the right path. You know, it, it, it's almost like God is putting brambles along the path to keep you as shepherd as he can, but you can go marching through them. I'm, I'm probably stealing something from a preacher when I was eight or 10 or something like that. But if she's okay with you, I wonder if she thinks that is she being punished for something she did, something she didn't do, or for you? Oh, that's, that's a good point. Um, I don't. I, I think it's more that she she feels she's being punished, but she doesn't know why. Yeah, and if God's the one punishing, then God's the only one that can answer it. And if God doesn't answer it, and she's honestly doing her best, um. What else could she do? That's um, that's a fair response. Um, Actually, I don't know if you want to jump I, in on this on the psychology of belief and stuff. Well, I, I, I'm 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 just kind of thinking about this this gentleman's dilemma here, and and it's it seems like a lot of times when people. Um, avoid challenging uh, loved ones religious beliefs is to protect them emotionally because they're afraid they're going to do some kind of emotional harm but is the belief of a punishing god doing emotional harm i mean because if god's punishing you you have no control over it you can't stop it you can't you can't you know you can't what are you going to do except for a plead for mercy so i i don't know i just i just think maybe can these kinds of beliefs be compartmentalized and saying, okay, maybe I'm not challenging God, but how about the notion of a God that punishes people at random when you didn't do anything wrong? I mean, could you go there? Is that, is that somewhere you could go without, you know, damaging the relationship? Um, yeah, that might be worth, that, that might be worth trying. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I don't know if there's if there's any more to specifically address. If you, if you have more questions or whatever, you can uh, call back. I, I also recommend, you know, even in the, even in the UK, you may be able to reach out to Recovering from Religion um, to see if there are counselors or Great groups idea. of people who are dealing with similar things. Because quite often, it, it, the people who are in a long-term relationship with a committed partner whose who's religious views or views on religion are different from theirs uh, it is not an uncommon situation. And, and talking to other people who've been in those situations, who may have, maybe I'll tell you what worked for them and what didn't work for them, uh, could give you ideas within your own relationship. But the, the thing I'm always going to come back to is... It's not really been a problem in the past, but I, right. but I uh, and, and it wasn't the sort of problem I expected it to be, but yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, the thing I'm always going to recommend is just have an honest conversation with your partner. Um, let them know that this isn't you trying to take away their religion or anything else, but you are worried that something has changed and that they are sitting there uh, feeling as if God is punishing them when, you know, not you're in a position where you don't think there's a God to punish them at all. But even if you agreed with them about their view of God, that maybe you don't see this as punishment and maybe they're reading something into it. But more importantly, ask them, what can you do to help and how can you be supportive while they're going through the difficult time? Okay, 
Thank you. Sure. Cheers. That's, that's a, a that's a tough situation. I mean, I the as the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. And so I'm not going to be in a relationship with a Christian anytime soon. Uh, very happy with the relationship I'm in. But I have met plenty of people who are, are in those situations. And, and what's worse is that sometimes it turns into a fight and a custody battle and all this other stuff. And it seems like they've been together for a while. This has not been an issue. And then boom, out of the blue, you know, hey, maybe God's punishing me. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I'm resisting the impulse to say, well, how about don't worship a God that, uh, you know, in a religion that's slaughtered thousands of people and is known for punishing people mercilessly, you know, try to try to move on from that theology if you can. But I don't know. A lot of times I wonder if there's also an underlying depression and people start feeling that that needs to be addressed because, you know, uh, one symptom of depression is feelings of worthlessness and that just tends to be entwined with religious worship where you feel less worthy than your God. I'm, I'm worthless compared to you. And, and it kind of gets, it kind of gets translated into, you know, into, into religion in, in that way. So uh, maybe there's that going on too. Yeah. It's, it's probably, I mean, through, through an organization like recovering from religion, they can get to something like the secular therapist project and, and things like that. Great it's just, mm-hmm. I don't want to, you know, he calls in about his Christian wife. I don't want to point her. Actually, I'd love to point her to the secular therapist project because then she'd be getting actual science-based help as opposed to perhaps going to a minister and stump someone who's going to just reinforce whatever spiritual, I don't want to use, well, I'll go with delusion. She's, she's currently under at least. Right. I, I worry. And, and, you know, let's, let's, let's take a minute on that front because, you know, I, I've sp- spoken with you. I've spoken with uh, Daryl Ray and Marlene Winnell and others. Uh, who, who've dealt with this, we have the Secular Therapist Project, which exists for a reason. And that is because without it, if you go to a therapist, they may just, in many cases, go along with what you believe and tell you, ah, well, this you, your spiritual walk has failed, or you need to talk to your minister, or you need to get right. right with God, instead of offering kind of sound science-based reasoning. Uh, you know, I, tell tell us a little bit about what you've seen in, uh, along those lines, and and you know why you're a fan of the Secular Therapist Project as well. Well, for that for that very reason, I mean, if you're if you're trying to um, address a problem like this through through spiritual means, I mean, what you, you're not going to pray depression away. You know, you need you need to to access uh, modern psychiatry and evidence based psychotherapies, and uh, instead of spinning your wheels. Um, you know, the, the, the former way. So, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's why I just, I, I value that organization so, so highly. I think uh, maybe, maybe somebody like her actually could benefit from, from that kind of therapy. Yeah. At it, least a referral, at least a referral for a secular therapist. Yeah. And if it finds that, you know, if, if you're, if you're involved, I find it curious because if I, if somebody, irrespective of what the religious beliefs were, let's say they were, they were, um, they found themselves a therapist that who's not secular, who, who is advocating for some superstitious, religious, spiritual, pseudoscientific woo stuff as well. That could, even for people who were accepted those sorts of things and, and it was part of their religion, that could still be something that they might not want. They might actually want, you know, hey, I, I, I think there's a God. I don't think God's punishing me, but I'm depressed. So stop telling me about how I need to get right with God. I'd love to get this. So the, the psychotherapist is is going to be good and beneficial for everybody, irrespective of what their beliefs are, because, you know, we're talking about real, the best scientific, you know, methods for dealing with something which is almost frustratingly ineffable to to science, which is human psychology. I mean, we have this field and it's a field of study, but it's, you know, it's not like we can put a brain in a beaker and determine exactly what made somebody be one way or or believe one way or how to go about changing it or whether we should make appeals to the norm. Uh, It's a field that obviously, I mean, gets a lot of derision, especially from like Scientologists. Scientologists freaking hate you. I mean, you, you you are, you are an abomination from, from the Scientologist perspective. Well, the feeling's mutual. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So we've got, um, let's see, let's get another call. We've got Shauna in New York. You're on with Hector and Matt. How are you? 
Hi, pretty good. I've got a question. If you're talking to somebody and you might have some questions and they, they say that um, their people's consciousness is, is a proof that God exists, what would you say to that? Well, you need a lot more than just that. I mean, that's just a statement saying, oh, consciousness is proof that God exists. They, they might as well say, look at the trees. The trees are proof that God exists. It, the, the, an argument needs to have a little bit more substance than that. Um, but at a guess, I'd, I'd think that they're saying, oh, we don't have a good understanding of consciousness. We don't have an explanation for, for how and why consciousness arises. And therefore, the God explanation is the better explanation. The problem is, the reason we don't have, if we don't have an explanation for something, which means we don't have a good understanding of it, that doesn't in any way mean that we should go leaping towards a supernatural explanation. Wh which God is responsible? How do you know a God's responsible? What, what, what about this God makes it an, actual, an actually acceptable answer? Why didn't you just go with it's magic? Or, you know, consciousness is proof that when somebody wishes in a well, things happen. I mean, the mere statement alone is not enough that could be, to, to serve as a proof that God exists. Okay. That, that helps. Okay. Is that all you needed? Thank you. Very much. Um, yeah. I mean, right. I mean, I, I know, I know that, I mean, the way I am looking into things, I, I know that what we think is consciousness could be just how your brain puts stuff together but I don't know how to prove that because there just isn't anything like you well, said, science doesn't know yet. You know, well, we, we do know that consciousness, as far as we can tell requires a brain. Like we have no examples of consciousness occurring outside of a physical brain. Right. Yes. That's right. And so while we can't say that there's not the, the idea, the appeal, is that there's a ghost in the machine or is that there's something magic in the mix or that what your brain does, there's something else in addition, but there's no way to actually demonstrate that. And when we go and test brains, it's pretty easy to, to determine that everything that people identify as something soul-like within a brain is malleable. Your memory, your preferences, your personality, the things you like, all of these things are malleable parts of a human brain. You can, you can, with the right probing and or chemicals and or damage, completely turn one person into undeniably someone else entirely through manip manipulation of the brain. And we've seen with like uh, hemispherectomy being done on the corpus callosum, that you can wind up with two distinct separate individuals communicating with from the same brain one of them will have access to the the speech portion of the brain and can speak and the other one will have to write um but you can demonstrate this i i there's a great talk from vs ramachandran um that you could probably find on youtube where he tells the story about a patient of his who went through this procedure and one of the two people who was in his brain was a theist and the, the other person who was in his brain was an atheist and how they went about detecting that it doesn't tell you how consciousness arises, but it does point to nearly everything we can determine about who we are as identifiable as a, as a function of the brain. And that there's, we can't rule out magic sauce or a soul, but there's no reason to rule it in. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Yeah. Sure. I, Hector, you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think you, I think you said it right there. I mean, uh, that uh, there's probably more to that person's belief than that statement. I mean, I'm, I'm often interested in the underlying emotionality driving these beliefs. Cause it, oftentimes it's not, it's not a, it's not an evidential problem, right? It's, it's, it's the fears that block the evidence. And so that, that's, that's where I like to focus. But um, yeah, no, I think, I think you, you, you explained it pretty clearly. I mean, we, there's no evidence that we have consciousness outside of brain. Even our medical ethics are based on that idea. When somebody's had severe brain damage and it's time to disconnect them, we can because of that. So, yeah. I, I hope that helps, Sean. And by the way, if the, the person or person or people that you're talking to who are, who are saying this, you know, consciousness proves God, um, have them call in. 
you know, I, I'd love to hear them present their arguments for how they got to consciousness, therefore God, um, because I, I can barely get from consciousness to therefore brain. And yet that's exactly the situation that we're in, that it, apparently consciousness is, is derived from what a brain does. Okay. I will, I will attempt. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good Sunday. And a good forever. Um, all right, we're gonna we're gonna dig in just a little bit. We got a couple calls that are asking about um, morality, and one of them, uh, Dean in California, you're on with Matt and Hector. How are you? <laughs> Mashallah, I'm on. Assalamu alaikum, Matt and Hector. I guess you could figure out what kind of theist I am based upon that. So essentially- I'm gonna go. I'm uh, gonna go with uh, Zoroastrian. Am I wrong? Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. It's that thing where you face towards Mecca and stop <laughs> listening. Yeah. No, 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 no. You stop drinking booze, I guess. I, I, I bet you don't eat bacon. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right. How I mean, can we help? People don't. Be... Okay. So my main thesis here is that I want to argue that well-being is not a particularly robust or coherent form. To, I mean, the base morality or ethics on. And first of all, I mean, we could, I want to talk about coronavirus or something related to coronavirus. And we could, we could all agree upon that coronavirus harms our well-being, irrespective of, of how we define well-being or, or whether we lack a good, robust theory or, or, or whether we lack philosophical theories of well-being, right? We could agree coronavirus, a COVID-19 infection would harm our well-being, right? Well, yeah, generally speaking, all the information I have right now is that, yes, COVID-19 yeah. is directly in uh, in, uh, in contradiction to an individual's well-being. But there's a bunch of different levels and, and aspects about well-being, including societal well-being. And when my well-being is in conflict with yours, how do we resolve those things? But go ahead. <laughs> I, that's what I, what I kind of want to get it, want to get into, I guess. Yes, I'm aware. And, uh, yeah, I, I've played so, this game once or twice. <laughs> And, uh, well, there's definitely a quote from, I mean, Matt's favorite philosopher and my favorite, my favorite philosopher. And uh, it is not contrary to reason to prefer, to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. So essentially the point there said by, my, by our favorite philosopher is that uh, reason cannot establish, you, you cannot use reason to even prefer to save the entire, to, to save the entire world. Okay, so... So therefore, reason cannot, in itself, cannot it be the source of moral motivation or or how we sort of judge judge what necessarily is valuable. Hang on. And uh, I think Hang on. coming back to. Hang on. I think the thing coming back to. Okay, sorry. Um, th that is about reason on its own. Reason. Yes. With a goal of well-being is a completely different thing because we can reason about what well, there's no there's not um like if we had chess pieces in a board and no rules and no goal we can't reason a winning move but once there are rules and a goal now we can reason for better moves and others and so if we say the goal is well-being and we work on definitions related to well-being then absolutely we can reason about the consequences of our actions with respect to that goal Yes, using evidential reasoning, you could sort of well said. consequences of your actions to see yeah. whether, whether it fulfills some sort of end, I guess. Sure. But the thing with, I mean, yeah, the, the, the example with like coronavirus, because I sort of remember like early on during the pandemic, I said to like a, a friend, like, I'm fine with the lockdown, but maybe in some point that I, I there'll just be a point where I say, screw it, and I just wish because of the social isolation thing and just hope everyone could just get out and cause let's say mass infections and that would be enough to lead to sort of herd immunity and and of course i think the point with well-being here is that of course having people not infected i mean we're not having people who are not preventing infection would is conducive to, to well-being right but also socializing is also conducive to well-being so the thing so, is why so you, one i mean is hang on a second dean so I thought we were going to have a conversation about whether or not well-being it, it serves as an actual decent foundation. Um, 
now whether or not whether or not somebody thinks well-being is a good foundation for morality i really don't care i care about whether or not people care care about well-being not whether or not they count it as morality because if your morality isn't about well-being i probably don't care about it because i care about well-being that aside what you're talking about here is essentially a scenario where we're doing cost benefit analysis where we are saying okay we're going to wear masks. We're going to shelter in place. We're going to not have gatherings of more than 10 people. We're going to shut down non-essential industries. And we're doing it for this particular reason. And the reason that we're doing it right now is to make sure that we do not have an infection rate that is so high that it becomes something that the hospitals and the healthcare system cannot address. We are, we are lowering that curve of infection or keeping it low enough so that we have the facilities to treat people and make sure this doesn't run away. Now, at some point, is it possible that the precautions that we're taking become more harmful? Is it possible for the cure to become more harmful to disease? Yes, that's absolutely possible. But in every discussion about that, we are always, always talking about well-being. So your examples or your concerns here of this cost-benefit analysis, the cost-benefit is still about well-being. So I don't know how you're going to get to some sort of objection to well-being just by talking about how are we doing the right thing with coronavirus now and might that change? Well, couldn't alternatively one have a passion to prefer socializing, like going to parties and prefer that? Why should one prefer? This isn't about, well, this isn't about preference. There are people who would prefer to kill everybody who disagrees with them. This isn't about personal preference. I'm talking about well-being. If you're not talking about the same thing, then we're just wasting time. Well, the, well, yeah, you, so in the sense you you are defining well-being in, in a particular cost benefit. So you're emphasizing certain things like avoiding infection as opposed to, well, one person could also value, let's, let's, let's say, the freedom to socialize, and that's largely conducive to well-being too because def, Hector Garcia is in – is interested in psychology and in the introduction of the show, he there's there's an adverse effect to uh, social distancing, I guess. Sure, but are you are you equating the adverse effect, the psychological effect of social distancing, with you know infection and possible death and from COVID nineteen? I mean, it's just a totally false equivalence. I mean, mm. well, I mean, well, I think most people would reasonably prefer to to live instead of go on social discs and social distancing, but ultimately there right. is no, I mean, ultimately I, but ultimately it comes down to preferring well living law. Lo- I mean, not no. prefer avoiding the risk of getting infected than, than opposed to another form of well being, which is largely just to maximize one social interactions, I guess, but there's no reason to prefer one over the other. Although, well, no, no, no. What you're basically arguing for, if somebody wants to no. maximize their social interactions, you might as well be arguing that, somebody wants to maximize harm. I mean, j- just because somebody wants to maximize harm doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Just because somebody has an individual preference for something that isn't well-being, th- there may be people who care nothing at all about well-being. They have excluded them- themselves from the conversations about well-being. If I'm going to have a conversation about what's in our best interest, I must necessarily be having that conversation with someone else who actually cares about what's in our best interest and not just what we might personally find preferable. That's what well-being addresses. It's not just, oh, you know, I really, I'm lonely. I wish I could socialize with people. Well, me too. I've been locked up since fucking March. I would love to go out. However, I recognize that this personal desire of mine for the sort of contact that makes my life better doesn't outweigh the risk of potentially uh, blowing up the infection rate to the point where we kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions more. We're already at 200,000 Americans and nearly a million people worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think anything else, Matt and Hector? Nope. Thanks. I mean, well, right. ultimately, yeah. well. Okay. I'm, I, I'm guessing that was the end, but they're, they're off. So the answer to that one seems pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things where, okay, let me, let me be, let me maybe clear. Maybe uh, somebody can snip this on morality and well being. I am in agreement largely with Sam Harris that the foundation that I would use for what we generally talk about as morality 
is something that we've identified as well-being. That's the language that Sam used. I had different language prior to that, but we were talking about the same thing and I preferred his, and so I've helped push it. That said, well-being is not, you, you have, can have legitimate objections to this line. You can say, ah, well-being isn't morality. And my answer is, okay, that's fine. If you think morality is something else, my question then becomes, do you care about well-being? Because if you do, then we can still have a conversation about well-being, whether or not you consider it a moral or ethical foundation. Because I do care about well-being, whether or not you consider it a moral foundation. If you say that your moral foundation is from God or whatever, I don't care what a God thinks. I just don't. If that God has something to tell me about morality, he can come tell me himself rather than you telling me what you think God wants about morality. Because and at no point does that is that in any way demonstrated to be a foundation that's in our best interest. God doesn't have to have our best interests at heart. And if you say, well, I don't care about our best interests, cool. You've also excluded yourself from well-being because well-being is about what's in our best interest. If you want to say well-being isn't well-defined, I would agree with you. But the fact that something isn't well-defined doesn't mean that it's not defined at all. It doesn't mean that we don't have a working definition and that we can't make sort of evaluations like, if I were to lop Hector's head off right now during the show, which would be almost miraculous since we're not in the same building even, um, that would definitely not be in his best interest. And it would probably not be in my best interest. And it would probably not be in society's best interest. And if you want to say that well-being is cumbersome because we have to look at individuals and groups and society and evaluate those well-beings and perhaps put them on balancing scales, I agree. There's a lot of hard work to be done. I'm sorry that you think morality has to be so simple and so beyond our reach that you would prefer to have it handed down from somebody else telling you what they think a God wants. But I care about well-being. But if you're just going to call in and say, what if somebody prefers something different? I, I have no response to that other than we're not talking about the same thing. But I'll bet you with every single person who thinks that they can just, oh, I don't care about well-being. I bet you they do. Because the people who genuinely don't care about well-being don't, don't tend to stay alive. They don't, they don't care about their own interests enough to take the sort of action, anybody who genuinely doesn't care about well-being, I either have nothing to say to them because um, they've excused themselves from the conversation or I have nothing to say with them to them because they're dead. So on that note, um, we're going we're gonna to move on to some others. Uh, Brian in California. Oh, there we go. Try it again. Brian in California, you are on with Matt and Hector. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Matt, Hector? Not bad. Good. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, if you're familiar with and what your thoughts were on uh, Pascal's mugging. Um, is that like where the mugger comes up but doesn't have their weapon? Yeah. So they're, they're basically like, hey, uh, give can, me your money. I can, read off the, I can read off the problem statement if, Hector, if you haven't heard of it or if you want to. Yeah, why don't you do that? Because it's you, you reading it. You're reading it's going to be better than me doing it from memory, but it's like a mugger comes up and doesn't sure. have a weapon, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll let you do it. Sure. I, I've got the Wikipedia page open. I can just read off the problem statement. In one description, Blaise Pascal is accosted by a mugger who has forgotten his weapon. However, the mugger proposes a deal. The philosopher gives him his wallet, and in exchange, the mugger will, the mugger will return twice the amount of money tomorrow. Pascal declines, pointing out that it is unlikely that the deal will be honored. The mugger then continues naming higher rewards, pointing out that even if there's just one chance in 1,000 that he will be honorable, it would make sense for Pascal to make a deal for a 2,000 times return. Pascal responds that the probability for that high return is even lower than one in 1,000. The mugger argues back that for any low probability of being able to pay back a large amount of money, or pure utility, there exists a finite amount that makes it rational to take the bet. And given human fallibility and philosophical skepticism, a rational person must admit that there is at least some non-zero chance that such a deal would be possible. In one example, the mugger succeeds by promising Pascal 1,000 quadrillion happy days of life. Convinced by the argument, Pascal gives the mugger the wallet. So it's a uh, thought experiment relating to maximization of expected utility. Okay. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. I, I don't know. Hector, did you have thoughts on it? Because I'll, I'll give my thoughts on it. I just don't want to no, stop. No, you go ahead. That's, I think that's more your wheelhouse. I, yeah. Yeah. No. So it's a thought experiment, and that makes it very difficult to nitpick because the questions that you would normally ask are, 
what method is the is Pascal using to determine how likely this individual would be to be able to offer them the I don't know how any individual could offer me a quadrillion happy days of life. I don't, I don't even know, you know, I mean, that's absurd. So there would have to be some demonstration that there would be a likelihood of that outcome. Otherwise you can't even begin to do the cost benefit analysis. It just becomes a hypothetical of, okay, how much do I have to promise you to convince you to give me whatever, whatever money is in your wallet. And, and if you don't believe, Hey, I'll give you the exact amount back tomorrow. Uh, if you don't believe that that's likely, then what good does it do for them to say, I'll give you 10 times that tomorrow? Because that goes to the individual's character and whether or not you think they're going to follow through with it. And so the, this cost benefit analysis is like, ah, how much are you going to risk? But this isn't a risk thing. It's it, it, probably a better thing than the, than the mugger. I mean, it doesn't change it dramatically, but it would be to like, I, a traveling salesman comes to your door and says, hey, for all the money in your wallet, I will come back here next week and give you 10 times that. Well, there's zero reason for me to think that this is real. I would need more evidence. So, hey, start showing me affidavits of all the other people that you've given, you know, 100 times that too. And, you know, can we get some sort of contract that guarantees, that, you know, that my risk is there? But apart from that, it's for me, just a, a, an interesting thought experiment that each individual is going to have to answer for themselves. Like if I've got a thousand dollars in my wallet, but it's a thousand dollars I need, like I took it out of the bank and I'm specifically going to do this. I, I'm not going to give it to anybody on a promise, but if I've got $1 in my wallet and there's a homeless person standing on the street corner and they say, Hey, if you give me the money in your wallet, I'll give it all back to you tomorrow, uh, tenfold. Um, I'm, and granted we've taken the mugging thing out of this because the mugging is ridiculous but I'm going to give them that person that dollar knowing that I'm probably never going to see it again. And so this is up to individuals to determine how much value a dollar or what the contents of a wallet has to them versus how much they're willing to risk. I don't see this as anything that has a particular usefulness in a broad sense. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to say was uh, the problem was coined by, and I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce this name, uh, Eliza Yudkowsky, who does a lot of work with AI research. So one of the things is considering the thought experiment in the context of an artificial intelligence, evaluating future possibilities and rewards. I don't know if that changes your perspective on it or not. No, not really. It, it, to me, it's there's lots of interesting thought experiments. I don't know that this one teaches me anything about myself or anything about reality. Because let's say I'm walking around just randomly with $1,000 in my wallet and some version of this scenario happens over and over and over again. I'm probably not giving it up. I'm probably because I don't, you know. However, what if it's not a mugger? What if it's just my brother? Even if I know that I can't trust my brother, I'm probably just going to go ahead and give him the money because he's somebody I care about. This is something you know, boosting that individual's well-being. So I, th I think there's way too many factors. Um, and this is just kind of like an, an overly simplified thing that I don't know where it gets us. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I was calling, like, I know that you've weighed in on the problems with Pascal's wager before and the name of Pascal's mugging is based on Right. referencing Pascal's wager. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, and I'm happy. Thanks thanks for doing that. I mean, Pascal's wager is different in the sense that there we're talking about some something, a, a, a proposition that people frequently accept and cite as for the reason why right. I might as well believe in Jesus because it doesn't cost me anything, even though it does. Right, right. And I'm going to potentially get infinite reward, even though there's no reason to think that's the case. The mugging is a little different, right. and and while it may hit, you may have some interesting applications for AI, I think it actually, and this is one of the reasons. This is it's interesting that Hector's here, because quite frankly, the only value that I see in in these Pascal's mugging thing is to teach us about the psycholo the, the psychology of people and how much they're likely to risk. I mean, it's not like we're learning a game theory exercise here. This is about individuals and how much they value what's in their wallet versus how much they're willing to risk it versus how likely the outcome is. You know, there are people who are more risk averse. Sounds kind of like trickle down economics to me. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. I think I think you're right on the money. Thanks for thanks a lot for the call, Brian. I appreciate it. I mean, there's a whole psychology about cooperation and cheater detection modules of the brain that I think this taps into, but yeah. And cheater detection modules in the brain? Well, so so what is remarkable about human beings is that we can cooperate on such a massive scale. You know, like like uh, evolutionary anthropologist uh, Richard Wrangham has pointed out. You know, you put a you put a hundred chimpanzees in a in a stadium, and they're going to rip each other to shreds. You can put you know a hundred thousand people in a stadium, and they're going to get along relatively well. We we can cooperate, but um, we also have special adaptations to detect cheaters on reciprocal exchanges, and we're really really we're really they're very sensitive. So we can tell when people are lying. We can tell when people are cheating. We can tell when people are making up things. You know, a lot of times. Sometimes we hide those realizations from ourselves to fit in. I think that's that's what uh, that's what underlies a lot of religion. That's what uh, that's what underlies the COVID deniers. Like we we hide beliefs from ourselves so that other cheater detection modules won't pick up on it, so that we can fit in and not be ostracized and not be ejected from the tribe. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. All righty. Uh, hey, this should be um, somewhat interesting. We got Rick. Is it in Michigan? Yes. Hey, Rick, you're on with Hector and Matt. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Not too bad. Okay, great. Rick, great how great. can we help? Yeah. So I was calling, I was going to call on a vastly different topic. And then watching a lot of you guys' videos, I see that you score like really easy points talking about like slavery in the Bible. Yes, I, I score like, incredibly really easy points that's... because the Bible's pro-slavery yeah. and slavery's immoral. Okay, so that's that's my point. I think I think I come here to like I think point out how I think you're very incorrect in um, saying that the Bible is pro-slavery. Well, um, okay, I can appreciate the fact that you think I'm incorrect. Now I've done an entire video on this that lives out there by himself by itself. Have you watched it? Where all I do is I watch the whole playlist. The whole playlist. I don't have a whole playlist. I'm I'm not talking about atheist experience. Well, I'm talking about um, experience is like the. I'm not talking about the atheist experience. <clears throat> I was talking about my atheist debate slavery video, where I go through and read what the Bible has to say. I well maybe not. Okay, so but... what? Okay, let's let's try not to get carried away so that we don't have to interrupt each other or jump all over. What is it that you think I'm actually wrong about? And then we can look at what the Bible actually says. So I think that you're wrong about the fact that the Bible endorses slavery. And I think what I'm saying is you're introducing in the question a particular interpretation of what the Bible says that is not necessary given the biblical data. And so what you can merely so curiously, you say, hang on, curiously, you say biblical mm -hmm. data. So. In Exodus 21, does it yes. allow people to buy slaves and own them as property and pass them on to their children? Yes, correct. Does it also allow people to beat those slaves yes. as long as they don't die within a couple of days? Correct, correct, okay. correct, correct. So how the fuck can I be wrong when you just agreed that the Bible allows you to buy and own people as property to pass them on to your children because they're your property and to beat them as long as they don't die within a couple of days. That's what I'm saying. Allows me. No, I'm not allowed to do that. It's so, so in the I Bible. It says it, Wait, it, no, but, you just agreed with me that the Bible allows that. Allows who me. It does not allow me. Okay, in Exodus 21, chapter or, uh, chapter 21, verse 2, where it says, if you buy a Hebrew servant, who is that talking to? Who is you? Okay, exactly. good. So he's talking to, he's talking to the, Moses is talking to the Israelites. So it's okay for the Israelites to own slaves, but it's not okay for you and me to own slaves? Yes, that's correct. That's the stupidest thing anybody's called in to defend slavery with is that the Bible no, 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 says no, no, that no, 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 let me finish. And it's not fair. Let, let me finish my case. No, I'm talking to okay. say that the Bible, which is supposed to be giving instruction to us, only allowed Israelites to own slaves is to suggest that on a moral ground, 
it is okay for Jews or ancient Jews to own people as property and beat them, but it's not okay for me. And yet nowhere in the Bible no, does it say, okay. no, no, I will hang up if you don't let me finish. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that I'm not allowed to do that. You're just making that shit up. You are using what the Bible says. That's like, there's no difference between thou shalt not do X and if you buy a Hebrew servant. Now you can Can correct me. Can I make my case? I I just said, now you can correct me. Stop whining and get on with it. No, I I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, so I don't want to sound ungrateful or anything, so I'm really grateful. So what I'm saying is, if you look at the biblical data, there are laws that apply in some places in the Bible that don't apply in other places. Where people are commanded to do things at a certain point, and other places are not commanded to do them. Agreed or not agreed? I'll agree. Okay, good. So I, my starting point is like not everything in the Bible is true. So how, oh, what do you mean by that? So I'll give you an example. In the book of Job, for example, the friends of Job, they come, they say things. And at the end of the book of Job, God comes and says, everything your friend said about me is incorrect. That I don't need you to, def- I, hang on. I don't need you to mm-hmm. defend the notion. I don't need you to defend the notion that everything in the Bible isn't true. I already accept the notion that everything in the Bible isn't true. <laughs> my point was that, own it, is owning another human being immoral? Yes, it is evil. Hang on. So. Hang on. Was yeah. it always immoral for everyone? Yes. Then the Bible advocates for something that you just acknowledged was immoral. Even if you think that the Bible only allows the ancient Israelites to own people, the Bible still allowed something that you and I understand is immoral and was immoral then. Okay, so like, do you would you allow Christianity, or would you like make it illegal? If you're I'm not, illegal? I'm not trying to make any religion illegal, but slavery should be illegal. Why do you keep deflecting? You, think, you, think, you just you, you, no, no, no. You just acknowledged that it would be immoral in ancient times for Israelites to own other people as slaves, and yet the Bible, even under your twisted little massaging to try and make it seem nicer, advocates for those people to own. So your Bible is advocating for something that you acknowledge is and was immoral. Okay, can I ask you a question? I I don't know. Are you going to acknowledge a point, or are we just fucking waiting for your turn to talk? I'm going to illustrate why I think your question is is incorrect. Like, you're making an assumption in the question. You're sliding in. No, no, I'm not making an assumption. No, sir, I'm not making making an assumption. I'm not making an assumption in the question. I'm using your admissions against you. I'm sorry that logic doesn't work in your favor. But if you acknowledge that it is and always was immoral for anyone, including Israelites, to own slaves, and you acknowledge that the Bible permits Israelites to own slaves, then you are acknowledging that the Bible is advocating for something that is immoral, correct? No, the error is to... No, sir, you don't get to say no. I just pointed out a logical argument where you are simultaneously accepting this conclusion and then claiming it's not valid. You have abandoned reason. Here, let me try it again. Is it immoral for people to own other people as property? No, it's not moral. Uh, Well, that's what I said. It's okay. So you're saying it's not moral. Was it ever moral for anyone to own another human being's property? No, Matt. Okay. Does the Bible permit people at some point to own other people as property? Yes. Then, therefore, the Bible permits something which you acknowledged is immoral, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. That's all I've ever said. Don't call in and tell me I'm wrong and then agree with me. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I... No, no, no. You called in to tell me I was wrong, and you just proved that you agree with me. No, look, look. But let me tell you, let me tell you. But ergo, what is the therefore? Because you would follow up and say, that means that God is immoral. No, I didn't say that. I said, did the, why, why can't you listen? Did the Bible advocate for, permit something which you just acknowledged was immoral? And the one and only answer is yes, which means what the Bible has to say about slavery is in fact immoral. I make no judgment on God because there's no God for me to judge. 
All I can judge is what the Bible says. And I've told people and read people what the Bible says. And you've now agreed with me about what the Bible says and agreed that it's immoral and then flatly tried to deny that it's immoral. No, okay. I never denied that slavery is immoral. The point that I'm making is you said multiple times the Bible advocates for slavery when it, it does. legislates it or allows it. Which oh, my God. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't care. Let me, but here, here this is really okay. simple. This is really simple. Does what the Bible in Exodus 21, Leviticus 25, et cetera, does what the Bible advocate with regard, support, allow, permit, endorse, pick the fucking word you want. Does the Bible's position, is the Bible's position on slavery immoral? No. <laughs> ah, so no, let me explain, let me explain. Nobody I fucking interrupted you. Person. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm getting ready to hang up on you, though, because you are a dishonest interlocutor. So if you have a point, make it like, make it. Okay, but will I be able to make it without interruption? Please. No, as a matter of fact, you don't get to make it at all if you, if you, if you try that one more time. Here's the thing. I'm going to say one more thing, then I'm going to let you talk, and what you say determines whether or not you get to continue. You ready? Yeah. You agreed that it's never and never was morally acceptable for someone to own people's property. You also agreed that the mm -hmm. Bible, in okay. fact, does permit someone at some point to own people as property. Mm -hmm. That means that yeah. the Bible is advocating for something which you acknowledge is immoral. But when asked whether or not the Bible ab uh, allows for something that you think is immoral, you say no. Please resolve that conflict. Okay, okay. So, so people are going to go back and watch the wording because that's not the exact wording you use. So, I'm a bit of so. I think the difference is this. So, the Bible's position on slavery. Is not immoral, but it allows something immoral. And the reason is a decision can only be evaluated given the, the set of possible decisions being made. So you're choosing the lesser, of evil, the lesser of two evils is the moral decision, even though the decision itself is evil. True or false? Do we agree on that? False. And goodbye for your dishonest evil. attempt to try to get away with saying that the Bible isn't immoral when it is, and you've already fucking acknowledged it. Goodbye. Yeah. You see, th this is what I was talking about earlier, how this, I mean, it's, it's obviously not an evidential issue. You can look in the Bible, the Bible pretty much says, you know, it does advocate or whatever word you want to use slavery. But I mean, this is just such a case of motivated reasoning. And for the audience who doesn't know what that is, it's like deflecting information to come to an emotionally preferred conclusion. Usually it's like to deflect fear, right? Yep. So that just bounces off and then all kinds of, you know, uh, cognitive uh, acrobatics take place to try and justify it. Yeah. Um, to, to quell fear. What is the fear? Fear of being ejected from the tribe, fear of, of, of not having eternal life. You know, that's that's fear driven, you know, but. So there are people who are going to be upset. Fight? There are there are people who are going to be upset that I didn't allow them to continue. And I want to be able to explain to everybody watching, the line of argument that he was going to go on is just that I'll be able to do it much more efficiently and effectively. Is it wrong to take property that isn't yours? Yes. Is it immoral to take property that isn't yours? Yes. Are there situations in which it would the most moral thing you could do would be to take property that isn't yours? Yes. If it would be, it would be wrong for me to break the window and steal from a store. But if in the window of the store is a defibrillator and somebody next to me is having a heart attack, then all of a sudden the most moral thing I can do is break the window, get the defibrillator and help them stay alive. However, those moral dilemmas where we evaluate something situationally don't apply when the situation that we're talking about is, is it okay, morally permissible, to own another person as property forever? Property fundamentally denies their freedom. Fundamentally, it denies their autonomy. Fundamentally denies their ability to do what they want. There's not a situation that you can come up with where actually owning someone's property is morally permissible, unless you want to try to come up with one. But what they'll try to do is say, ah, you have to remember, in these ancient times, people really had a choice after a war of whether or not they were going to be slaves to their captors who had beaten them in war or whether they would die. And of course, it would be much more moral to allow them to live as slaves than it would be to allow them to die.
Well, that's not necessarily the case, which is why some slaves chose death. And denying them the option to choose that is what's fundamentally immoral. So trying to construct a scenario where you take what the Bible says and try to massage it into, uh, well, it's better than being a prisoner of war. Yes, but you know what else is better than being a prisoner of war? Not being a prisoner or a slave. See, it's a completely dishonest line yeah. of argument where they yeah. want to have their cake and eat it too. And it's and all that's, that's pretty obvious. And it's a truism. It's just it's yeah. just so emotion driven because if you question that, if you question that morality, you you questioned your imagined protector and all the the feel good emotions that come with that delusion. So so yeah, it's it's just uh, <laughs> I could see why this would this would heat you up so much because I mean this kind of this kind of um, moral reasoning is what gave us slavery. You know, and all yeah. kinds of other other inhumanities. Yeah, it's know. um, it's it's a lot, and it's become like a weekly thing, which is why I'm not going to have somebody spend too much time on slavery when we have you here. We do though have Ron in Florida who had a question specific you for you. Welcome to the show, Ron. Hey, uh, Matt, how's it going? Hi, Hector. Doing well. Hello. Uh, so I actually had a question specifically for Hector, kind of along the uh, lines of psychology. Um, my brother is uh, suffering from various mental illnesses, and my family has kind of uh, been separated by that. Like, he's kind of isolated himself, and they've isolated themselves from him just mostly because of that. And my family has kind of taken up the uh, mantle of, well, he just needs to learn to power through it, and he just needs to learn to get over it. And that's what we did. That's, you know, that's what he has to do. And I don't know how to combat properly. I don't, I don't find myself equipped well enough to know how to combat that argument properly. And I was wondering if I could have some advice on that. Oh, gosh. Um, how old is your brother? Uh, he's like 24, 25. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, he, he can seek mental health um, help on his own without them, right? So... So I mean, I mean, changing their perspective on mental health—that's an ongoing. That's an ongoing challenge. I mean, you know, it's not a matter of strength. It's not a matter of just pulling yourself up from your bootstraps. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, neurophysiological uh, basis for a lot of our psychiatric conditions that that I think maybe 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 they could benefit from learning about that. I, I, I'm sure there's there's tons of videos online about about that. But um, as far as him getting the help he needs, is are they a barrier to that? Uh, a little bit. It's less of a barrier than um, he's kind of putting up a lot of the barriers himself. But it's more of a um, community uh, community barrier. So like you know, he doesn't have as many resources as you know. He he finds it hard to reach out. He doesn't have a lot of friends. He doesn't have a lot of like people he can reach out to. And you know, he's always been close with me and my family and. So it's kind of more of a mental barrier than anything, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much so much um, stigma, I think, uh, about mental health that that I personally and a lot of people try to try to fight just through education. And there's tons of educational resources online to to expose people to telling people telling your story, getting people education. I mean, what can you do? Seeing it as a as a personal weakness. I mean, that's how old are your parents? It sounds like a very kind of old school way of looking at mental health. Yeah, no, they're they're definitely on the uh, older side. Um, they kind of subscribe to that more uh, traditional view of like, like you said, pull yourself up by the uh, bootstraps. And, you know, that's not really the way it is anymore. So it, it's very hard to convince them. So I was just kind of hoping to see if I could get some uh, more tips and, you know, help expand my toolbox in that matter, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's there's there are online resources for that all over the web. Just look up, you know, combating M MH stigma, and they're they're neatly packaged and easily digestible. I mean, that's that's the way to go. And sometimes you just won't be able to reach people, but you know what? You ignore that when you have to and get the help that you need, uh, because it's not a personal failing. You know, it's 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 you know, mental health is is not uh, something people choose normally speaking yeah awesome thank you very much i appreciate it yeah sure right. thank you ron yeah it's, it's incredibly frustrating that you know granted 
when I, when I have people, and this doesn't just relate to dealing with things like depression or whatever, any potential subject where someone comes up with what, like where they've become a Google PhD, where they went and out and did some searching and they found some sources and now they're the expert and they're going to stand, they're going to be the Don McElroy of this discussion and stand up to these experts. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation with them to try to point out where they're wrong. But at some point you, you get to uh, diminishing returns where if I keep talking to you, all we're doing is going around in circles. We're helping nobody. And yeah, at that point, yeah. I'm just going to say, I'm going to trust the actual doctors and not your ability to Google. Yeah. I mean, some of these questions are easily answerable, you know, I mean, like that one, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. We have, um, Mark in New Mexico. You're on with Matt and Hector. How are you? Hello. 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 Can you hear, can you hear us? Me? I hear you. I can hear you. Well, that's then maybe we oh. can start. Oh, my apologies. I was thinking, okay. How are you today? Not bad. How are you? You need to turn down your, your, I can hear our audio behind you. You hear behind me? Oh, okay. Let me turn that down. That's what, okay. Is that better? I guess so. How can we help? What's up? Well, it was pretty interesting listening to the last three, three or four callers, actually. They all kind of uh, pertain to what I was thinking in ways of how we look at religion and atheism. Kind of, I guess my question is, do you think atheism creates a contentious point for people to come up with new theological ideas just to fight it because of how human beings are social creatures? Atheism is merely not accepting theistic claims. It atheism doesn't do yeah. anything. It's not an Yeah, I'm saying but with the this the term well like I knew you were gonna say that kinda. <laughs> like do you think when you're trying like I do you think when you're trying to dismantle something, if you don't have something prepared to replace it you leave a power vacuum that causes chaos so i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out exactly what it is that i think you're asking and it seems to be like oh if you manage to convince people that their religion that they accept isn't believable uh have you set them up in a position where they don't have anything to fill that void once they stop believing is that kind of what you're asking mm, well kind of like, what are you asking then? I'm not clear on it either. Like I'm saying, like, I feel like people wanted to defend uh, theism and Christianity so fiercely because they look at atheism as a object that will dismantle their social order and security of what they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Sure. I mean, uh, basically, so basically you're saying you called in to ask, are some people afraid of the possibility of what might happen if they were atheist? Well, no. Is there something that would be a good way to convince people to leave Christianity by just saying, I don't believe? <laughs> so my goal... Very, I'm saying it's almost like create the cult. Because like, if... Like, I believe that whatever I believe is what I believe, and it's going to be a theological, not in a scientific matter of theory, but a theological sense to it anyways, because in a scientific world, who, what, why, where is all you need, but, I mean, who, what, when, and how is all you need, but why is left up to the observer. And as a human being, everybody's always going to have a why in some sense or another, and if you don't have an answer for why, whether it be a scientific answer or not, why what? I feel are lost. Why? Why right? what? Huh? Why anything? People want. There are why. tons of scientific answers for why. Well, I, I genuinely, I mean, it's not Mark, to understand that why. 
Mark, I genuinely have no fucking clue what you're asking. Yeah, I don't know either, I think. Okay. We'll move on to, to some other folks. Maybe think about it, write some stuff down, take some notes, call back. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And <laughs> don't smoke so much cannabis before you call. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Dave's not here. I saw somebody say that in chat, and I thought that was extra funny. Nathan in Louisiana, how are you? You're on with Hector and Matt. So I'm agnostic, and it's because uh the, the the christian all religions basically have not proven without a doubt that there's a god that's one reason why i'm agnostic another reason why i'm agnostic is because the atheists uh they have not proven that there is no god now i understand that you do not need to prove it that there is no god i understand how all that works well but clearly you don't Okay, I mean, so what I'm I mean clearly is, you don't. Because if you right, understood so, how it works, and that is this, there here's a claim. Some God exists. Theists accept that claim. Atheists do not accept that claim. Atheists are not necessarily asserting that. that no. Well, if you understand that, then are you a theist or an atheist? Because there's no other option. There is an option. There no, is there's option that says, no, there's not. No, there's not. No, there's no, no, no. It doesn't. See, this is the thing that you don't understand. There is no there is no other option, no other middle ground between I believe X and I do not believe X. Those are the only two options. It's just like... Okay, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that one plus one has to equal two and there's no other way around. I get what you're saying. No. I, for my personal... For my personal... I'm just trying to figure things out. That's all. I, okay. I, I understand okay. you're just trying to figure things out. I'm trying to explain it to you because you come to me telling me you understand something and then the, what you say demonstrates that you don't. All right. Can we just move on from that for a second? Cause yeah, because I don't care whether you call yourself an, cause I don't care whether you call yourself an agnostic, a theist, or an atheist, or anything else. I would rather discuss whatever the point is. But if you're if you want to start a discussion about the labels, which is okay, what you the did. The point is that there's a such thing as called agnostic, right? Yeah, there is a such thing. There's actually a couple such things that are called agnostics. There's Huxleyan agnosticism, which uh, is slightly different from a generic agnosticism. But if we're going to be done with the labels, let's talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. Yeah. So the reason why I'm calling is because one of the major reasons why people are agnostic and, and, and have this questioning about it is because the evolution is the fact that we cannot figure out how humans came about. For example, uh, you can't just throw screws in a dryer and have a huge machine come out of it in a hundred years. You can't just have, uh, you walk into the jungle and a thousand years from now, you see a huge mansion out of nowhere. Things don't work that way. So Actually, they do work that way that because, because there's a mansion here that didn't exist a thousand years ago, right? I don't know what mansion you're talking about. There's a mansion down the street from me that definitely did not exist a thousand years ago, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Does it have to be a mansion? I ha I'm living in a house that did not exist a thousand be, years ago, it right? Be a, it, it could be a house. Uh, it could be a shed. Okay. I, I, really? Okay. Pop up I live, wood, I live here. I Stop, Nathan. I live here in a house. It didn't exist a thousand years ago. That's how it happened. Somebody built it. It was a human that built it. And what exactly. I'm is without exactly. Human intervention, the, exactly. Without that, human intervention, how, that house would have been created. A house is not the universe. See, the difference between something that requires an agent to act and something that doesn't is entirely about, does this occur naturally? You don't need a creator for a tree. You, don't, you do need a creator for a house, as far as we can tell, because we have no evidence that houses naturally occur. But all of the evidence shows that trees naturally occur. I get that trees naturally occur. However, okay. something had to create it. Okay. No. Something had to. No. Well, you that's the problem there, because, uh, you know, if, if you're going to have the argument where something just appeared, I didn't say it just appeared. The tree came from an acorn. Well, how did it come about? 
The tree came from an acorn, just like you came from sex. And where did the acorn come from? From the tree that was before it. And this is what I'm trying to say. We can go into this circular all day long, okay? It's not circular. It it's linear. It. it begins with Big Bang cosmology and an expansion of the universe and physics and chemistry that ultimately result in a planet forming around a particular sun. And at some point, because of physics and chemistry, there's an atmosphere on that planet and a set of situations that is conducive to the first self-replicating mo molecules. And then from there on, get all that, okay? I'm no, not you don't get all that, or you wouldn't be interrupting to show me that. What I'm trying to say is that there has to be some sort of force Prove it. using evolution to create things. No, okay. If, if like you would example, stop, human is born. Okay, Nathan. Let's say human is born. You're muted. If you would stop telling me what you understand, I could perhaps direct you to resources that could teach you what you don't understand. Okay. You're back. Okay. Let's not put words in each other's mouths. I'm not here to do that. I'm trying to tell you I understand and I agree upon this evolution thing. Okay. There's no doubt about it. Evolution is real. What I'm trying to say that evolution is a tool, a mechanism that has been put forth, put in this creation by some type no. of force to create. No, this. sir. If you would stop pretending that you understand things and telling me how much you understand, I could explain what you don't understand. Evolution is not a tool. Evolution is a description of processes that occurred. Evolution is a change in allele frequencies over time. Evolution is the diversity of life because things that reproduce do so imperfectly. Evolution has nothing to do with the origin of life, which is something that we do not yet have a complete understanding of or even an explanation for the origin of life. The origin of life is independent from the evolution of life. Do you get that? I get all of that. Then but you said that there had to be something. Hang on. Right Nathan, hang on. You also said that something had to put evolution in to creation. First of all, it's not a creation until you demonstrate it's created. So let's stop calling it creation and just call it the universe. Second of all, you claimed that evolution had to be put here as a tool by some creator. That is absolutely the antithesis of what evolution actually is. Evolution is not a tool. It just describes what happened to life. That's it. It's There's no... I no creator required. No creator required. I disagree, and I'll give you an example. Why? Well, Congratulations, you uh, disagree. So you have, let's say, you have two chimps, two apes. They have a, a baby, and you're saying that this baby just comes out human? Because that's, <laughs> that's basically what you're claiming. I mean, I've heard. No, no sir, it's that. not. Nobody no, no sir, Nate. Where Nathan. Exactly. Now your ass is muted again. That's not what I claim. That's not what science claims. I am starting to get to the point where I don't believe that you are a sincere, honest individual and are instead trolling because you're coming up with mind-numbingly bad straw man versions of evolution just so that you can knock them down. Have you bothered to go and study? This isn't uh, some type of uh, troll, man. This is This is why most of the people believe that there's a god okay and you're you're not yes, because they are monumentally ignorant about science no most people believe there's a god because they are monumentally ignorant about the science as you are and yet they are convinced that they understand it as you do and they are wrong now the question is have you bothered to go out and actually look into the science because everything that you've said about what evolution is is, is the opposite Pretty much my whole entire life. Okay, I used to go. You, you've spent your whole entire life studying the science of evolution. The you you spent your whole entire life studying the science of evolution, and you understand this little about it. What a waste of a life! I, I wonder if this is another whether this is an evidential issue or not. I mean, I mean, why does there have to be a creator? Why does there have to be a creator? Why Why would you say that? Two chimps cannot 
just suddenly automatically create a human. Agreed. Okay, literally the baby human. All of all of all of the baby human that came out. Now you're muted again. Yeah. I do not believe you have spent your entire life studying evolution. There's literally yeah, okay. no evolutionary scientist on the planet who would ever utter no. the sentence that one that two chimps can't give birth to a human because that's yeah. not what evolution says. You have not studied evolution your entire life. I'm not even convinced you've stu you've studied it for a moment because yeah. you are coming up with a straw man of what evolution says. No, dude, this isn't about straw man, okay? It doesn't matter I tell you what, what the pause. argument is about Nathan, where humans Nathan, come from. Nathan, the problem Nathan, is pause. That a human comes from something and has been Nathan, evolved. You're muted again. I'm going to take you off mute. And when I do, I would like for you to explain to me what a straw man is. What's a straw man, Nathan? Um, look, I didn't call here to argue, okay? You seem yes, to you argue fucking with did. A What's people? a straw man or I'm hanging up? I'm not, listen to me, man. Stop being rude. Bye. If I say something's a straw man and you tell me it's not, and then you can't tell me what a straw man is, now I know you're not listening. Now I know you don't care about honest inter interlocutor. Now I know you, you are just saying no, no, no to everything that I say, which means we're not in a discussion, which means we are not having any sort of equitable conversation at all. It would be much better for you to acknowledge your ignorance and say, I don't know what you mean by straw man, at which point I would explain to it that when someone constructs a straw man, that is a particular logical fallacy where you construct a fictional version, a mock-up of somebody's argument that isn't quite right because it's so much easier to knock down and set fire to than the actual argument. That's what a straw man argument is. And if you just said that, we'd have been fine. But instead you came in to say you didn't call in to argue, which is clearly a lie because you were arguing. Did you think did you think he was really an agnostic trying to figure things out or I do but I think that moreover he's convinced he has got it figured out and that the theists are just they they go too far and the atheists go too far too I think that's where he is Yeah but I I don't know because it's hard to get an actual honest uh, answer out of people Yeah like that. I could see that I I'm not sure if he was really trying to figure it out or not and, and to get it to get an answer to that or not yeah uh i'm gonna try this uh michael in arizona you're on with matt and hector how are you good how are you i, I i'm okay i'm i'm more than a little nervous about your uh what what it says you're calling about yeah god is a paradox i don't want to talk about the paradox that is god so a paradox implies that it, it doesn't exist, right? It both does and doesn't exist. No, no, no. Something can't both exist and not exist at the same time in the same way. That's impossible. That's why we would call it a paradox. That is the paradox. Correct. See, but but you're, you're the one who's claiming cool. that God both exists and doesn't exist. What is the evidence that God exists There doesn't need to be evidence. Uh, Congratulations. Then you don't need a response from me. Goodbye. <laughs> you can't call in and say God exists and God doesn't exist and then say you don't have to prove that God exists. Because if you don't, I'll just stick with the doesn't exist. See there? I no think paradox. I have to agree with you on that one. Yeah, no paradox, no problem. We have uh, Vernaz in the UK. How are you? Welcome to the show. You are likely to be the, Hi, the final call of the day wonderful thank you matt thanks for taking my call i'm a first time caller and uh, my question is uh, and something i'd like to discuss with you is why does god always have to be connected to religion why is it that it is always either somewhere in christianity or hinduism or islam or buddhism why does this concept of God always be connected to religion? Why can't there be a concept that is God, or you can name it what you want? It really doesn't matter. The word is not, doesn't have to be God, 
but it could be something else which is not connected to religion. I, I don't believe in religion at all, but I do believe in something, not a someone. The problem is three-fourths of the planet believes there is a someone, but I believe there is a something. And uh, that's all I really want to ask you with your viewpoint on this, that why does God always have to be, it's been carrying on for centuries, that God, after all, the word God to begin with uh, was in its plural form. It used to be gods. And then it became in its singular form, which was God. So I don't think the name really matters. Can I, can I ask you one question? What, have you ever tried to operationalize what that something is to define it? Yes. yes what I have you come have. up with? And, and it's taken me many, many years of research to try to find out about it. And uh, yes, I have had a personal experience too. But, and I'm a complete non-believer in religion right from the time I've been a child. And I right, but what is that something? You said not a not a someone, but a something. How would you describe that thing? I think operational definitions are important. Yes, I agree with you. It is very important, and I think that is the dilemma on the planet to actually put that into a few lines or a few words. But uh, my own personal experience did show me that it is. 100% not, and I'm a scientific thinking person, and I don't believe in religion, but that one fine day on December 19, 2015, uh, for one hour, 48 minutes, uh, I was shown something, something, not a someone, not a light in the distant, not a godly figure, but I was shown something, and it's very difficult to articulate it. But I can certainly send a mail to anyone who would like to hear it out, because I have always been a scientific thinking person, and I was taken by shock, by shock in 2015. And all my life, I had no belief in any religion and in any God. Right. And I don't, yeah, so I, so it's just very difficult to articulate it. And I just wonder why people keep on connecting that damn God with religion, because it has nothing yeah. to do with religion. Yeah, those kinds of things are has. difficult to articulate, but I think there is enormous value in keeping on that mission, you know. To test oh, what your beliefs yeah. are, like keep trying to describe it, and does it make sense? I mean, it's hard. You can't. I mean, got to give us something here. I think I got. I got to get. I, I got to yeah. get a couple of points in because it addresses your question. So first of all, there are some religions that don't include a god. There are also god beliefs that don't necessarily rise to the level of religion. Why? Why do we keep having religions that have gods in them? Because that's what people do. People. Mm -hmm. You know, once they're convinced of a God and they need some kind of structure and all this other stuff, they construct a religion about it. And then they're going to fight with other people and then you get more and more religions. So there are some religions that don't have gods. There are some God concepts that aren't attached to any particular religion. Your view is one of them. Uh, since we're so late in the show and since, you know, w when Hector asked you about it, you, you, you were basically talking about how it's, it's kind of ineffable, difficult to describe. I would love for you to send an email to tv at atheist-community.org that, that like includes Wonderful. your story of what you experienced. And I will forward it to Hector as well, um, because I would love to understand it, especially from yes. you know somebody who's scientifically minded, because yes. I have yet to find anyone who advocates for one of these experiences who has any sort of evidence that would warrant or justify belief. And the best that they can ever do is something happened to me and I can't say for sure what it is or if it ties to anything outside of me. It's very confusing, but I don't want to say, oh, there's nothing. And it, and it, it, it ties to people's appeals for higher powers or uh, confidence or fears about an afterlife or, you know, not being loved or no, being alone, no. et cetera. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that's yours. Yeah. I, I'm not right, saying that's yours. Right. What, 
what I'm saying is that that's what I've gotten a lot of. And so if you have a different story, please email, write it up and email it to TV and Atheist African Community. And then once we've read it and I, I've reviewed it with Hector, maybe you can call in another time and now we can have some kind of conversation about it. But, but without the details, we're kind of stuck and we just hit the 90 minute mark. So the show's over. <laughs> Okay, not to worry. I just thought I'd call in. And I'm from a very small religion on the whole planet. It's the smallest religion on the whole planet. Is it so, just you? Uh, <laughs> well, it's just 100,000 people left on the whole planet, and it's Zoroastrianism. Oh, you are a Zoroastrian. Yes. I, I, am, okay. I was well, Please, this please. Yeah. Please email tv at atheist-community.org because I would love to hear from you. And I've been looking for a Zoroastrian to actually have some conversation with. And so if you're if you're up for that, I'm I'm eager to hear from you. Cool. But don't forget, Matt, I've never believed in religion all my life. Even though my parents were religious, I never yeah. did believe. But I think it was all just adding up to that one goddamn day of my life. Yeah. Well, I greatly appreciate the call and I look forward to hearing from you. But we, we've got to go, Vernas. So thank you very so much. Have a have a good day. So, first of all, I want to thank Hector for being here today. And I'm glad we got that call in late because, I mean, you had, it was really nice to have you here to, to address that, you know, the, the psychology behind what people are, 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 are dealing with and how difficult it is when somebody says, ah, it's hard to describe what I believe. Right. It yeah. makes me think neurochemistry when they say something like that, you know? Yeah. It, it reminds me of times when I've been high. Where it's like, right. oh, it's really hard for me to describe certain things, right. and and I, I get that, and I'm all for the scientific investigation of that stuff. Uh, I also want to thank all the crew again, especially the people who screened the calls today, um, as they were incredibly uh, helpful. Could because there were some uh, duplications that we kind of got rid of in order to make sure we could get, get done in time. Somebody just said solipsism is the is the smallest religion, uh, so that that's pretty damn funny there, Ira. Um, <laughs> We, we will be back uh, next week and I'll be doing what I can to get uh, Hector back and involved with a number of things we look forward. Uh, if, if we can throw his uh, screen image up there one last time so that you can get all the information you need about how to contact him at www.hector slash Garcia.com um, and look forward to his new podcast and everything else. Please take care of yourselves. In addition to thanking everybody and thanking the people who were active in chat and who donated and made this, um, I'll have more to say uh, on a new show on Wednesdays that's not associated with the ACA, particularly about political things. And so for anybody who is like Matt has gone through this entire show without mentioning the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you can find out more on my Facebook. You can find out in some discussions we had. I did not want to uh, make the show today about that because it just happened and we're still waiting to see what the fallout's going to be and i didn't want to detract from everything but irrespective of what you thought politically of ruth bader ginsburg and it's a it's it's an it's an interesting minefield considering that antonin scalia was one of her one of her if not her best friend or at least her best friend of the court um we lost a giant in the supreme court and in the legal field on Friday, a giant who we have, we owe a great debt to, particularly when it comes to equality issues, particularly when it comes to church state separation issues. And equality and church state separation are absolutely within the wheelhouse and mission statement of the atheist community of Austin. And there's nothing partisan about right. my statement. Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be sorely missed. And I hope that she is replaced with a new justice that rises to her level of accomplishment and significance. And on that note, please take care of yourselves. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. What will it take for you to start
What are we doing, man? What are we doing? No, 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 no. No, you're done.